All right, here we are on Sunday, April 2nd, 2023. It's nice out, a little windy though. It is 47 degrees and the winds are 14 miles an hour from the north to northwest. I don't know if I'll be sitting outside today. I don't know. But I'm out and about and I'm trying to have a positive day. Had a decent weekend so far. And I got a confession. You guys are going to hate me for this. I've never actually seen the Ten Commandments. With this week being both Passover and Easter. I don't know why I said it that way. Easter. Um, I It dawned on me this year for whatever reason. I've never seen, in its entirety, I've seen clips. I've seen parts of it on TV in years past. But I've never seen in its entirety the Ten Commandments. And I said, you know what? Come Wednesday, ten bucks off of uh, Apple TV uh, to own it. Why not? So I purchased that. And I'm going to watch it. And I'll do my review. I haven't seen a lot of classic movies now that I really think about it. I've never seen Ben... I've seen parts of Ben-Hur... Never seen Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind is one of those films I've been meaning to see. And for whatever reason, I kept putting it off. Um, I did see Citizen Kane. And while I understand the significance of it, I gotta say this, I wasn't a fan. I know. Uh, horrible. I'm a, I'm a film buff. I'm a film fan. And you didn't like Citizen Kane? It was okay. <laughs> I didn't hate it. But I was like, ah, technically it's a good picture. It's about a guy missing a sled. I'm sorry. That's what I take from it. Maybe I got to rewatch. Maybe I'll be in the right mindset when I watch or something. I don't know. This is Citizen Kane is one of those movies where, you know, it's almost mandatory that if you like movies, you have to like this. I think Roger Ebert famously once said that if he was on a desert island and could only bring one movie with him, it would be Citizen Kane. Well, it's great for Roger Ebert, I guess. Me? I'm sorry. Ghostbusters is better than Citizen Kane. I'm sorry. But to me, that's true. That's my subjective truth, okay? <laughs> Sue me. Well, don't. I, I barely have any money. <laughs> but... I wanted to do, you know, since we got Passover and Easter this week, I, you know, I want to watch some religious films, you know, faith-based films. And here's the problem with that. There are some that are considered classics, like the Ten Commandments. There are some that are controversial, like The Passion of the Christ, which I have seen. And, uh... The Last Temptation of Christ, which was Martin Scorsese's film, which I saw years ago, and I don't recall being a fan of it. I wasn't offended by it, but I was just like, yeah, okay, that's that's one interpretation. That's that's interesting. Wasn't a fan of it, you know? And then there's a lot of... What was the other one I was thinking of? Noah, R Russell Crowe. I really liked Noah. I was like, that, that was good. That, it wasn't too heavy-handed with the religion, you know? And I like Russell Crowe. I think Russell Crowe's a great actor. I want to see Russell Crowe as a, as a Jedi at some point, you know? I do want to see this this month, speaking of Russell Crowe, I do want to see that um, the Pope's Exorcist with him. That looks good. And I don't usually like those kind of movies. I saw the trailer for that. I was like, that could be interesting, Right? But anyway, let's get back to talking about religious films and all that. Pun intended? God bless anyone who wants to make one of these things. Because I tell you, especially in today's day and age, anytime anyone says they want to make a religious film, it's, it's almost instant controversy. It's, it's, we live in an era now where I don't think you could do it without some level of controversy. Case in point, Mel Gibson wants to do a sequel, and I think he's 
prepping to film The Passion of the Christ 2. Which I talked about previously on here. And I'm not opposed to him doing it at all. I'm actually, I've seen further interviews of him, to, you know, talking about it. And I'm like, okay, now you got me interested. I mean, you still have a, a, a problem of the entire cast that's returning being 20 years later on the story that play, takes place only three days later. Must have been a hell of a rough three days. Which it was, the way he was talking. He was talking about, you know, showing the harrowing of hell and all that. I'm like, ooh, that could be that could be visually interesting. That could be interesting. There's a unique take on that. Especially with today's visual effects and everything. You got my attention there. But, you know, it's going to have controversy. And, you know, because the, the last one did. And anytime you do any of these films... You get controversy. And to me, as a, a would-be filmmaker, I don't know if I'd, I'd ever want to do one. I gotta be honest with you. I feel like, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with the headaches of all the, you know, the, the self-righteous, you know, holy rollers saying, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm destroying the Bible, or I'm doing this, or I'm doing that. You haven't seen a single frame of footage yet. You know? Here's, here's my point of view. I never once felt any religious-based film I saw was outright offensive. Or at least not intentionally. There were things in films I, I disagree with, right? The Last Temptation of Christ, the first scene is Jesus watching two people bang. I was like, this is kind of creepy. You know, I... I, 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 I there's a scene where it was like some sex show or something. And I understood the intent. I understood the artistic merit. And he wasn't doing anything too, you know, he was watching like some sort of sex show or something. I remember that scene and going, here's an interesting opening. Not something I would have done. But I get it. He's, he's trying to explore, you know, that version of Jesus in, in, in The Last Temptation of Christ is, is tempted by humanity. He's exp The fucking film is called The Last Temptation of Christ. You know, okay. I could see how people had a problem with that. But it didn't, like, destroy my personal beliefs or faith. And by the way, while I, while I got you here, I'm talking about Religious films in the in the artistic term. I'm not trying to project any of my personal beliefs. I want to be abundantly clear here. Whether you have your beliefs or you don't, I'm talking about culture and religion in terms of narrative when it relates to film. I'm not trying to preach any... Any point of view, any religion, I'm not trying to preach anything like that. So so I, I hope we're all on the same page here. So whether you have your beliefs or you don't, we're talking about taking scripture and text in terms of a narrative and adapting and in, interpreting it onto film. So that's my intent here. Right? So, you know, I don't want to hear that I'm trying to preach or I'm trying to project morals or values. See, here's the thing. I'm even hesitant to even do this video. But I feel there, there, there's merit to it in terms of artistic observation. You know, uh, interpretation in terms of filmmaking in general. Because this is primarily a filmmaking, film-based channel. You know, yes, I talk about anxiety and depression, and yes, I talk about technology too. But this is this channel is primarily based about movies, and my love for f movies. You know, and religious films are part of that. I mean, the Ten Commandments, whether you know, regardless of your religious beliefs, is considered a, an epic Hollywood classic. You get what I mean? So, I just want to pre-emphasize that here. There were, but speaking of films that I weren't fans of, but I never felt destroyed my 
faith or beliefs in any way. Um, Ridley Scott's Exorcist, Gods and Kings. I believe that's what it was called. It was the one with Christian Bale as Moses. There was a scene in it. That, that whole film was a whitewash movie. I was like, you got all these big name actors, none of whom are Egyptian. Right? You... That's a whole issue into a, in and of itself, you know. You have Christian Bale, who's British, playing Moses, who was Middle Eastern. Okay, in the 50s and that, that, that kind of was the norm that was accepted because we weren't, as a society, sadly, we weren't that advanced where we could accept that, you know, Middle Eastern biblical characters could actually... God forbid, be played by people of the same ethnicity. You know, back in the 50s and that, look, if you weren't white, you probably were relegated to a side, you know, a, a side character, like a waiter or a, 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 a something usually stereotypical, sadly. That was, that was the era. And it's unfortunate you know, unless you were doing something like, say, Raisin in the Sun or something like that, you you weren't you weren't gonna get away with having a Middle Eastern actor play a Middle Eastern character. It's the way the world was back then, sadly. I didn't I, I, look I wasn't even alive for that period of time, but sadly that's how things were. Right? So, like, okay. This whole thing with Charlton Heston, who is not clearly wasn't Middle Eastern, playing Moses, who was, and then you have Yul Brenner, who was born Russian, playing Ramses, who was Egyptian. You know, I haven't seen them. I haven't seen the whole movie. I've seen clips of it. I was doing some research on it before the video, and I was like, "Oh yeah, all right." That was accepted back in the fifties. When did Gods in Egypt come out? Uh, uh, Exodus Gods, uh, or whatever the hell it was. That was, that was what, 2010? Something like It was like around 12 years ago, 15 years ago, whatever it was. It's like, come on, man. And then you had a scene where Ridley Scott's depiction of God, I just found hysterical. I didn't think it was... It was offensive on one level. Like, I could see how it could be offensive. But it was just funny. Right? It was like, it was one of these, like, like Ryan Johnson, we're going to subvert your expectations just for the sake of subverting expectations. Right? Where God was depicted as this little kid. And I'm like, it, 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 Ridley, it's, it's God. It's the supreme being. It's the creator of everything. Right? Whether whether you believe in that or not, narratively, it's the end-all, be-all. It's the head honcho. It's the boss of the universe. It's the creator and ruler of the fucking universe. And you have an eight-year-old kid playing God? And then there's a scene where Moses proceeds to lecture God, the Supreme Being, about uh, a war of attrition. And I'm sitting there going, oh, oh, God. Oh, this is bad. This is hysterically bad. Like, wh wh what? I remember that. That was the one scene in one of these religious films where I was like, I'm offended how stupid you think I am. Like, I get that's your artistic interpretation, but it's like, come on. Like, why? Explain this to me. You have Moses lecturing God, played by a 10 year old. Oh, well, a war of a. And I'm like, oh, boy. There goes that movie. <laughs> I'm laughing at how bad it was. 
I mean, God, God's got to have a presence. In, in a religious-based film, when God or an angel or su a, a supernatural supreme being shows up, you, you got to have some level of presence and gravitas and seriousness. I mean, you can't have a 5-year-old or a 10-year-old like God. Why? Especially when it, when it, when you're handing out the fucking Ten Command. Excuse me, I mean no offense, but I'm talking about the movie. I'm not talking about the actual event. A burning bush makes sense. Some sort of flame or elemental thing. That kind of makes sense. You have a kid telling Christian Bale how to write the Ten Commandments. <laughs> what? Oh, see, see, I did something artistic. I subverted your expectations. Yeah, in the most dumbest way possible. Here's another thing. I, I am currently, well, not currently, I'm filming a video, but I am currently, because I've never seen it and I've heard good things about it, watching Jesus of Nareth, Nazareth, right? This, I guess it was, I guess it was a TV movie. Hell of a cast. I mean, you had, you, you had Ian, Ian Shaw as, as, uh, um, Judas. You had Ian Holmes in it. You had Ernest Borgnine. You had, uh, James Earl Jones. I mean, they got a hell of a cast in this thing, right? I am maybe an hour into it. You know, I'm just at the point of, uh, the first Christmas, Right. And I'm watching this thing, and I'm going, okay, you got a great cast. The sets look okay. I mean, look, I mean, you could tell it's a budget. But you got great costuming. You got your great cast. The score's a little overbearing and annoying. But the opening of this thing is like... It's like watching paint dry. Right? And I'm sitting there going, oh, oh, okay. Um, you're missing, like, all the... All the all the good beats here on this thing so far. Again, you know, the actor playing Jesus uh, hasn't even shown up yet. Jesus was literally just born in this one, right? And I'm sitting there going, okay, you, ain't, you show Mary receiving the news about her upcoming pregnancy and all that with her just staring at a light out the window talking to herself. I'm like, uh huh? Uh -huh. Well, we couldn't we couldn't film some guy in an angel costume or something, All right? And you totally skip over the, you know the scene in the field with the shepherds. They just show up. They just knock on the cave on the on the uh, on the manger because apparently it had a door, right? They just show up and go. Oh, we were told. That. I was like, you you couldn't show the scene with them out in the fields and like. With a light or something? <laughs> like, I get we're working on a budget here, folks. I get it. You know, it's the 70s. I'm, I'm not expecting George Lucas uh, Avatar visual effects and everything here. I get it. But, like, you could make this feel a little bit more biblical. <laughs> right? Like, uh, that that's how you show that. Oh, okay. Mary's talking to an angel, which is just a a spotlight shining out the window. And her mother's like, "Who are you talking to?" Like, hopefully it picks up. But right now, I'm I'm not that impressed with it. I mean, if, you, if you're going to tell us, look, if any film, if any narrative you're going to make epic, I mean, I think it's fair to say the Bible is an epic. Whether you believe it or not, it's it's an epic. <laughs> like, some of these scenes are like, this is like paint drying. Like, Okay. I don't know, man. I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully it picks up. 
it's a six hour film, but I was, I watched some of it to, uh, last night and some of it this morning and I'm sitting there going, I really hope this picks up. This is a, six hours of this. Oh boy. I, I, I don't know, man. I, you know what a great, it's not, I wouldn't say this is a religious film. It does have religious elements, but you know what could have been a great religious faith-based film that was, could have been truly epic? What Dreams May Come, the Robin Williams film, which is more of a fantasy with biblical elements than really a biblical film. I mean, it deals with heaven and hell. But it's not particularly faith-based. I wouldn't I wouldn't classify it as a faith-based film. But Robin Williams, late great Robin Williams, where dreams may come. I really enjoy that film. Although that film really has some questionable fucking narrative choices. Anyway, the film is, if you haven't seen it, Robin Williams plays a doctor. His wife's an, uh, uh, an artist. They have two kids, a son and a daughter, right? The two kids are killed in a car crash. They survive the death of their kids. They deal with the emotional grief of losing their kids. And it's it's all intercut. Right? And Robin Williams, one day as a doctor, goes to help a car accident and ends up dying. And he goes to heaven. His wife, now having lost her husband and the kids gets into real depression, ultimately commits suicide. And because of that, she goes to hell. So the film takes place in the afterlife with like a, you know, a rescue mission. Kind of a version of Dante's Inferno. Now here's the thing about Dante's Inferno. We'll get back to what dreams may come. I tried reading the actual poem, Dante's Inferno. I've tried reading that. Yeah. <laughs> I gave up and just played the video game. Yes, there's a Dante's Inferno video game, which is a God of War clone, which is basically, it, it sounds like a badass, and it is a badass video game. It's, you know, a crusader dies and goes through hell to save his wife because the devil has captured his wife, and he's going to kick demonic ass the whole way through. I was like, okay, this is shallow. This is really not the intent of the poem. But it's, it's a fun video game, right? Didn't read the book. Played the video game. <laughs> That's on me. But anyway, what dreams may come. Great, epic film. Some really dumb narrative choices. Right? The whole create create your own heaven. I love that. I was like, shit, I hope, I hope the real heaven, if there is such a thing, and I believe there is, if there is such a thing, Great. <laughs> that's, my, that's my kind of place, right? <laughs> Create your own heaven, right? The depiction of hell, I kind of like the shipwreck aspect of that. There was like some interesting visuals there, right? But the whole movie, I felt, falls apart when you have characters who are depicted, who intentionally disguise themselves as other people. Case in point, Robin Williams, feeling a little lonely, feeling depressed. He's got his guardian angel there, his, his, his former mentor. All right, he, his former mentor goes off to do some work and, and Robin Williams meets this, this Asian flight attendant character who's showing him around like, like central heaven, I guess, or whatever, right? And the plot twist, spoilers if you haven't seen the film, is the Asian character, the Asian flight attendant character is actually his daughter who died, right? And it's a plot twist just for the sake of a plot twist. I'm like, why? Why, why, why not just show his daughter? Why? Why? Why did we need this this build up to this reveal, which was so transparent, right? And then there's another scene where 
characters switch identities, right? They're trekking through hell. It's 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 Robin Williams. It's it's um. Oh, what's his name? He he voiced Vigo. I can't Vigo the Carpathian. I can't think of his name. Max von Sydow. It's Robin Williams, Max von Sydow, and Chris. Um, oh, it's Cuba Gooding Jr. Right? They're trekking through hell, and it turns out. Uh. uh, uh Cuba Gooding Jr.'s character, who was the whole movie serving as his mentor and guide to hell, that all of a sudden is his son disguised as someone else, character named Albert. Hey, points there. <laughs> and Max von Sydow is really his mentor. And I'm like, wh- why? Why did we need to do this? Like, this really drags down the movie. This is just confusing. It's like, wait a minute, wait, when were you him? And when? And they try to explain it throughout the movie. And I'm like, you, you're wasting time. You know, you're wasting time and, and the energy of the movie, the flow, the narrative flow of the movie. I don't care who's who. This shouldn't be in there. Focus, the, the epic journey of from, you know, death and heaven and hell should be the focus. And yet we're doing this. Oh, I was really this character, and I was really this. I was like, "Ah, ah, 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 why? I mean, you had such great momentum going. You were like, okay, I'm with you. I'm with you on this journey. We're going into hell itself. We're going to... And then it's like, even as they went deeper into hell... It's artistically, but it's tame. I was like, this is hell? (laughs) I was like, I expected a little bit more demonic imagery. Okay, the shipwreck. I mean, shipwrecks I kind of get. But then then it's just like, this is a kind of a tame hell. Hell should be... Look, I, I get there's a stereotypical version of hell. I get it. You know, flames and brimstone. Of, but you should incorporate a little bit more of that. Right? Ultimately, he meets his wife in hell and she doesn't recognize him. And there's that whole drama there. I don't want to wreck the movie for you. But even though I'm sitting there, I'm watching this. And this is like their dream house in hell. I'm like... This is hell. This, this this looks like a bad neighborhood in Detroit. <laughs> Which could be its own kind of hell, I guess. But, like... Okay. I don't know, man. Like, like the power of movies and, and all you could do with it. I would love to do... I would love to do a version of Dante's Inferno. Like, as an epic. Like, if I was a filmmaker, I'd be interested in something like that. Like, exploring the afterlife. Like, as a narrative. From a visual standpoint, from a character... Because you you're you dealing with characters who are already dead. You can't... You, here's the thing about, like, okay. You can't kill off these characters because they're already dead. <laughs> so you have to have, have different ways of... of Character or uh, interpretations and 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 drama and all that you, you you could get really psychological and all that with that kind of thing. I'd I'd be up for that challenge, but I knew I I know, I knew as if I've already done it. The second you know I, people go oh you're making a movie about heaven and hell oh oh you know then you have the whole religious community on your ass going, oh, you're going to do this, and oh, there's some controversy. It's like, oh, for fuck's sakes. It's almost like a taboo. or from, It's not really taboo, but it's almost like one of these issues with filmmaking where you know, if you, if you make a religious film nowadays, or, or even with religious elements, sometimes you're making a 
propaganda piece. I've seen some of these films from these churches or whatever. They're like, what? Really? Really? I don't know. I don't know. It's 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 just one of those things I find funny about filmmaking, where it's like, oh, you can tell this story, you can you can tell these characters about you know with all these superpowers and all, but once you once you do anything pseudo religious, even that's when people start to have a problem. I don't know. Anyway, I'm over half an hour here. This is out. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you guys later. Peace.